It's a great day in the insurance claims industry. We thank you for joining us today for another edition of the Practical Adjuster brought to you by FreeClaimInfo.com. My name is Jerry Adair, and today we're going to be discussing the topic of taking statements related to an automobile accident. If you've watched any of our other videos, you know that we've discussed the topic of taking statements in multiple ways, including the permission and other aspects, preparation, that sort of thing. Today, we're going to drill down specifically on those issues that would relate to an automobile accident. So if you have questions about the other general topics and taking statements, check out some of the other videos to get yourself up to speed before you jump into this one. Now, when you're dealing with an automobile accident, uh, there are a couple of things you want to do, and some of the things are consistent with, with all other statements, but some are a little unique. So we're going to start with having the person you're interviewing commit to their story. And what I mean by that is that you want to you want to press them a little bit because you don't want to be able to have a statement full of, I don't know, or I'm not sure. That's not a good statement. You can't put words into their mouth, nor should you try. That's not the, that's not the point. What you want to do is you want to have the person give you answers that you can document uh, that is their answer, such as you ask a question about distance. How far away was that vehicle when you first saw them? Now, some people might say, I don't know. I, I have no idea. I don't know how to tell you that. Okay, that may be an honest answer. Okay, so what I will do is I will read back to them things such as, okay, let's start with this. Was it further than 10 feet away? They might say, Yes, probably we think so, right? Okay, is it less than a mile? Yes. Okay, good. Then you've established a, a window or a parameter of, of distance, and you can drill down uh, repeatedly until you get to the point to where you've settled in on a reasonable number that they've committed to. Uh, if their answer is continues to be, I don't know, or I'm not sure, then if nothing else, you've documented that they're really not interested in trying to, to provide you with an answer. Their goal is to evade answering your question, and that's going to be clear to anybody looking at this, uh, looking at the, uh, listening to the audio of the statement or reading the transcript, which is, it's okay. You've had them commit to their story. If someone says, I don't know in their story when, when you're interviewing them, they can't later say, well, now I do know. So one of those two instances, you weren't being truthful. Which one was it? Second part is you want to assess the type of witness this person will make. Um, there, if you see them in person, then assessing their physical attributes, uh, tall, short, big, thin, old, young, that sort of thing. Uh, additionally, their communication skills, their, uh, how they present themselves. Do they carry their self like they're being honest and truthful, or do they appear to be making it up as they go along? Now, I've done this a long time, and I can assess a lot from people on the telephone. Of course, it's much better if you see them in person, but that's not always practical or possible. So you make do with what you have. If your interview is by the phone, then you do the best you can uh, listening to them and, and assessing them based on those characteristics that come through the phone line. That's all you can do. Another thing you want to try to do is you want to assess what type of, uh, uh, whether this person is an observant person. And so that's why you'll ask a lot of questions during the course of the interview which are designed to determine whether or not this person is, is somebody who observes a lot of things. And, and, and one of the reasons for that is you'll have people that will give you very specific details about one aspect of the incident that's important to them. Maybe it's the, the distance to the intersection when they enter the intersection, if it's a traffic light dispute, or how close they were behind another vehicle when they started to stop, or things of that nature. So, in contrast, if you ask them other questions about uh, the, the number of people in each car, the make and model of the car, the color of the car, um, landmarks on the side of the road, other things of that nature, anything else you can think of that you might can establish, whether it's true or false. If they were able to observe those kind of things, then that tells you they were an observant person, and maybe those things they're telling you about the actual incident are true and accurate because they're, they're that type of person. Now, conversely, if there's someone who can't tell you any of those other normal facts that they should be able to tell you, but yet they can tell you something very specific about the accident, maybe that, that takes away some of their credibility just a bit. Okay, if you're interviewing someone about an automobile accident, uh, whether your title says so or not, you're an investigator. Okay, your title may be claims representative, 
But in this instance, you need to be an investigator. That's what the job calls for. So when you're interviewing someone, keep in mind that you're not just there to go through a list of questions and the answers are what they are and you move on and that's the end of it. No, you're there to interview that person to establish the facts that you need to form an opinion. Well, it's most likely going to be about liability, that sort of thing. So I want you to understand that you have to be nosy. You have to get down and dirty sometimes. And I don't mean that to be disrespectful to people, but you, you have to be able to, to listen to their answers. And if you don't think they're giving you a full and complete answer, then you have to follow up and dig in. Okay. An example might be when you're asking about distance. Some people will say, I don't know, and they may truly not know, or they may be trying to avoid answering your questions if they've been instructed to do that by their attorney. There are a host of reasons, but you need to not accept their first answer, I don't know, as acceptable and move on. You need to drill down. So I will throw questions at them such as, well, was it more than 10 feet, okay? If you're talking about the distance of another vehicle, they're probably gonna say, well, yeah, okay, was it less than a mile? Uh, I think it was less than a mile. Good. Now you've established a window. So they're trying to give you answers at that point. Your job then is to give them questions and frame them in such a way they can honestly answer you and help you arrive at the information you need while you're helping them establish distances. Sometimes you'll need to use landmarks. Was it near that big tree on the corner of that house near the accident scene? Oh, was it near that water tower? Or how far was it from that traffic sign or that light post or whatever landmarks you can find. Maybe there's a business there and you can say, were you in front of that business? Was the other car, was it near that business or this other business, things of that nature? There are a host of ways you can get people to narrow their focus and give you some information about intervals and distance and placement of vehicles. That's your job to ask those kind of questions. You're the expert. So use your expertise to, to have them answer questions in such a way that will help you gather the information you need. Now, sometimes I'll also ask questions that I know the answer to, and, and this is designed to, to get them to talking. Maybe it helps me determine if they're being honest and truthful. If I ask them questions about something in particular that I already know the answer to, well, their answer is going to tell me if they're being honest or not. That's a good way to help assess that person's credibility, in my opinion. You also want to be uh, able to ask leading questions. Uh, sometimes you don't want to ask specific leading questions, but oftentimes you'll need to do that. You're trying to get them to fill in the blanks for you. And some people are good at communicating details. Some are not. You get a bunch of yes and to no answers. That's not very good. It's not very helpful to you. So you might need to ask leading questions such as, would you say the uh, the vehicle was traveling less than 20 miles per hour? Or do you think they were traveling more than 40 miles per hour? What, what's your opinion? You know, you're, you're kind of putting them into an area where they can give you a yes or no answer. And it tells you some of what you need to know to help make that assessment of the liability. Okay, now we're into the questions at the interview. And you need to be able to focus on getting the information that you need. So how do you go about doing that? Well, um, there's a couple of things I like to consider. And that is I want to uh, be firm in what I'm trying to get from that person I'm interviewing. Now, I don't mean that to say you browbeat them or you, you try to force them to give you the answers that you want. That's not what I mean. What I mean is that you, you ask specific questions, and oftentimes people will either intentionally or unintentionally answer a different question. Uh, you'll ask, uh, how far away were you when you saw X? And they'll start rambling on about something, and as you're listening, you realize they're, they're telling their story if they want to tell you, and they're really not answering the question that you wanted to get them to answer, okay? That's when you gotta be firm. You gotta back up, focus, and drill down into the, the details of what they just told you and say, okay, but now what about X, okay? Slow it down and, and don't let them off the hook. If they're going to not answer your question, you can't help that. But what you can do is you can document within that interview and that statement and that transcription later on that this person had every opportunity to answer that question. And it'll be clear to anyone listening that, that it wasn't, that they weren't asked that question. They were asked it repeatedly and they were refusing to answer, okay? And that's okay, they've committed to that. It's also good because if they later on, if they say, I don't know, let's say that's their answer. And later on, this case goes to litigation and they're forced to answer that question on the witness stand and they have a different answer. Well, the defense attorney is going to use this interview 
to dispute their version because they're going to have two different answers. One is, I don't know, and one is X. Okay, were you being untruthful then? Or are you being untruthful now? So you've accomplished what you want. If somebody's trying to play games and not answer your question, then you've accomplished your goal, which is you force them into a particular answer, whether they that's what they intended or not. Now, the other thing is you want to focus on details. Uh, people will give you general ideas about things and general descriptions of things. And so I like to focus on things that can be very specific, such as give me the make and model of the other car. Okay, what lane were you in? Um, what what lane was the other car in? Uh, where were you going at the time of the accident? Where were you coming from? Things of that nature. Things that you can force them to give you or they can, they can give you an answer, but maybe it wasn't what they expected your questions to be. They were expecting your questions to be just about the actual impact. Okay, so you want to ask questions about other things that help assess their ability to, to gather data to be observant or not. So you're asking questions about details, uh, things like what part of the car did the impact occur? Was it to the front, the rear, the right, the left side, things of that nature? Uh, where'd your cars end up? Okay, where, what part, what lane were you in when the impact occurred? You know, focus in on details like that. Were you near this point in the roadway? Were you near that point in the intersection? Had you just entered the intersection? Were you almost out of the intersection? You know, you're sort of narrowing the focus to getting the specifics of where they were. You're pinning down their version of events. They're still telling you what they want to tell you, but they're being forced to give you a lot more details. Now, if they're being honest, that's not a big deal. It's what you should be able to do. But if someone's attempting to not provide truthful accounts, uh, it's going to become relevant when you sit down and you examine all the answers they gave you with the facts. You're going to find out that some things just don't match up. I've had that happen often. And it's an excellent way to get people to, to answer questions which might actually help prove that they're not being honest when they give you their version of events. Now, when you start talking about uh, the details of an auto accident, there are a few things that I've learned over my years to help you assess uh, the credibility or lack thereof of, of people that you're interviewing. And so one of the things I always do is I have people give me their route. And usually this is something they're really not expecting. When you ask someone to tell you where their day started or where that trip started, what location, and what were they intending to go to? What was their intended destination? I get enough specifics that you can put them both on the map and see does the, the route from point A to point B lead to the point where the accident occurred, or doesn't it? And it's one of those things where if people are really not expecting. Maybe they've got a, they're being dishonest and they're trying to give you a, an account of the accident they want you to believe. They probably haven't given a lot of thought to those kinds of details. They didn't think you were going to ask about those, those kind of things. And sometimes they'll end up giving you the honest truth, not realizing it's going to dispute what they're trying to tell you about the accident. Now, the route is not always a big deal, but it's another piece of evidence to help you pinpoint the honesty or truthfulness of someone, okay? It might help you determine whether they were coming from work or not, whether they were coming from home or not, whether they were coming from a, a nightclub or something of that nature, social event, who knows? But that's, that's why you do those kind of things. Uh, maybe you go to uh, the extent of finding out who they met with when they left place A that kind of thing. What were they doing at place A? Those are all kinds of things that you can do if need be once you've established the details of where they came from and what they were doing, what, they were, what their route was all about, where they were headed to. Now, you also want to clarify any expertise this person has. So if their job is, to, is a traffic engineer, well, they've got a lot of expertise about traffic controls and lane usage and all those kind of things. On the other hand, if they're a, uh, might be a housewife or they're an artist, maybe they have very little information about that kind of stuff and they can't give you a lot of expertise. So it, it might help you to determine whether someone's uh, got some extra information to give you about an incident. When they tell you that I think the vehicle was traveling 30 miles an hour and if they have expertise as a traffic engineer and they've done that kind of stuff in their career, they're, they're a pretty good witness to be able to attest to that kind of detail. But maybe they've, they've done something entirely different and maybe their credibility is not so great in establishing the speed of a vehicle. You also want to determine if they have some familiarity with this scene. So if they're traveling their normal route from their home to their work and they do this every day, that might tell you that they should know this area pretty well. 
So when, when you're asking questions about the intersection and lanes and all that kind of thing, uh, they should have very good expertise to be able to tell you those kind of details. And if, if something comes up during the course of the interview where they just said they didn't know or they weren't expecting that, well, that raises the question, you drive this route every day. Why wouldn't you expect that? Has it, has it changed? Is something different than what you're seeing every day? Another piece of the puzzle. Uh, reconstructing traffic accidents is something that specialists do uh, in many ways. And as an adjuster or an investigator, we don't have to have the same level of expertise that those experts do, traffic uh, reconstruction experts, engineers, that kind of thing. We don't have to have their expertise because we don't have to produce the same level of, of a product as they would in reconstructing an accident. However, automobile accidents are really not as unique as people might seem to believe they are. And you can typically take the post-accident details and you can help reconstruct what likely occurred. Once you establish the facts as presented to you from the different drivers and witnesses and you go to the scene, it's not that hard sometimes to determine what actually occurred. Now, one of the things you wanna do is you want to document all the uh, conversations post-accident with everyone. Maybe they mentioned something that might help you to reconstruct the accident based on that conversation. Also, um, conversations that immediately follow the accident are considered to be utterances, and courts give them great uh, weight because they're most, most likely to be the true facts before someone has an opportunity to think of a different version of events. So they, they give great credibility to those kind of statements injuries and observations of anybody in any vehicle. So you'll ask people a question about who was in this vehicle, who was the driver, was it a male or female, old or young, what did you see on those people, injuries, how many occupants, what seats were they in, did they exit the car alone, did they have to be helped out by ambulance attendants, so that kind of thing. Get as many of those kind of details as you can. And then evidence at the scene, things like did you see any tire skid marks for a vehicle sliding. If someone says they brake to avoid an accident, there should be skid marks somewhere. Look and see if you can find those. If you didn't, it makes you question, well, did they really try to stop? Maybe you see yaw marks, which are tire marks left in the pavement when a car is trying to turn quickly and hard. They'll leave little impressions on the ground with, with black, unusual looking curvature marks. That's kind of interesting to find those. It might help you to see a car was trying to avoid an accident. Maybe they were making a turn a little fast, that kind of thing. Look at the, or ask the details about the post vehicle position. So if two cars collide, uh, we can find out where the collision took place based on the evidence. And then you wanna find out, well, where did car A end up afterwards? You wanna have them give you the position, the direction it was facing, the approximate distance from the point of impact, what it was near, was it up against the curb? Did it go off the roadway? How far, which direction? Enough that you can draw a little diagram while you're doing the interview and place where this vehicle was. Do that with every vehicle in the accident. Now, that will help you sometimes if speed is a factor. You're trying to determine if a car is traveling fast or not. Uh, looking at how far they travel post-impact will help you make that determination because a car traveling at a slow rate of speed is probably going to stop right at the impact or pretty closely thereafter. If a car travels a great distance after the impact, you're talking 100 feet or more, they're most likely traveling at a decent speed. Now you can do some calculations. There are some charts. We have those on some of the free claim info tools that'll help you to do that sort of thing. But you can come with some close proximity to making a, an assessment that this vehicle is probably going more than 20 miles per hour based on these factors. You might not can nail it down with, with certainty and exact speed, but you can come reasonably close enough to tell you whether you need to engage an expert in, in reconstructing the accident. Now, when you're working on an auto accident claim, you know that uh, most likely there's gonna be police involvement. So when you're doing your interview or your statements, that's something you want to address. And I'll ask these kind of questions of anybody that I talk to, whether it's a, if an insured driver, the claimant, witnesses, so on and so forth. So one of the things you wanna find out is, is which police agency it was. Uh, if there's more than one officer out there, get as much information as you can about the officers that were out there. If there are people that were involved in the accident, even if they're witnesses, uh, find out their involvement with the police. So did the police officer come and interview them? If there's more than one officer, try to get a physical description of which officer it was. Uh, find out what the officer asked them, what the officer told them about the results of their investigation, I guess. 
Uh, and also one of the things I like to do is ask people, did you overhear the officer when he talked to the other driver? Were you close enough? Sometimes they'll be real near one another and they can hear the conversation. So I'll ask that. If they did, what did you hear? Tell me what observations uh, you can tell me about their conversation. Who said what? Now, then if there were citations issued, find out what you can about that. Find out the officer gave them some information about why he was citing them for whatever it was. Maybe there is a legitimate reason. Maybe there isn't. Uh, and the last thing is when you're dealing with police officers, they're human like everyone else and they have their biases. Uh, so you want to try to draw that out if you can. So I've, I've asked people specific questions about this when they'll tell me, yeah, I think that officer had made up his mind before he started talking to me. He talked to the other driver. They seemed to be very friendly with that person. And when they came to me, they really didn't ask me much. They just said, here's what we're going to do. So the officer clearly had some bias. Now, we don't know that it was an improper bias or anything of that nature, but there seemed to be something going on there. So that might be a situation that you want to address a little bit. And what I mean by that is maybe you need to go talk to the police officer. Ask him, can you tell me what led you to make this determination when you issued a citation for this or that or the other or didn't issue a citation for that? He might have a legitimate reason, okay? But again, he'll either tell you that or he may assess that this person really does seem to display some bias. Maybe you can see that in your interaction with that police officer. Maybe not. Maybe you come away with a completely different point of view and you think the officer was just doing their job and our our driver that told you that is just not willing to accept reality. Now, also something to consider is that a police officer issues a citation. That's not necessarily a piece of evidence. As long as the driver he issues it to uh, pleads not guilty and goes to court over that citation, then it's not admissible as evidence. So just because he issues a citation to one driver for failure to maintain safe lookout and that driver pleads not guilty and the court says, no, I think you're guilty. Well, that's never going to enter the civil trial. It's not going to be a part of that. If we, if, he, if our driver pays the fine, that's an admission of guilt. That is usable. That's important. So you'll ask those kind of questions. If it's been long enough, they've already had the citation resolved. Ask questions about that. Did you did you pay the fine? Okay, if they did, that's an admission of guilt in, in, in the eyes of the law, whether that person knows it or not. Well, this concludes our video for taking statements about an automobile accident. I hope that you find it to be interesting and helpful. And if so, please consider uh, liking it on YouTube. Uh, we would also appreciate you checking out Free Claim Info for other tools, documents, and guides that are on that site, as well as other videos and a blog. Uh, there are posts on the message board about each video that we produce where you can read questions and comments from others. You can post your own questions that someone at Free Claim Info will try to answer or someone else in our claim community can jump in there and try to answer that for you. Thanks again for joining us.